Doxa Church. It's great to be able to lead worship for you. Please stand and let's worship together. Oh Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds thy hands have made, I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe displayed. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. God his son not sparing sent him to die I scarce can take it in that on the cross my burden gladly bearing he bled and died to take away my sin then sings my soul my Savior God to how great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. When Christ shall come, with shouts of acclamation and take me home with joy shall fill my heart then i shall bow in humble adoration and there proclaim my god how great thou art then sings my soul my savior god to how great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Amen. Is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. Let's sing that again. My hope is built. is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. Christ alone cornerstone the weak made strong in the Savior's love through the storm He is Lord Lord of all when darkness 
seems to hide his face rest on his unchanging grace in every high and stormy gale my anchor holds within Amen. Please be seated. Would you pray with me? Lord, we do proclaim that through this storm, you are still Lord of all. Uh, it's hard, God, to always uh, manage all of our fears and anxieties and doubts and struggles and questions uh, through a time like this to try to figure out how to live life and Lord, are you there and are you carrying us through it? And Lord, we turn to your scriptures and we are reminded once again that yes, indeed, you are sovereign over all things, including this, this COVID-19 pandemic time in our, in our world. And we trust you. We give our hearts over to you. We give our fears over to you. We give our anxiety over to you and proclaim that through the storm, you are Lord of all. And we proclaim this in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, Docs of Church. Uh, we are now going to move this uh, online service into a time of uh, online giving. This is a <clears throat> offering uh, at Docs of Church is a time when those who are part of the local body of Christ here at Doxa, who call Doxa Church home, it's a way for us to worship the Lord by taking all of the blessings that he's given us, the financial security that he's given us, the, 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 the ways he's poured out into our lives and given us uh, the, the resources that we need to, 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 uh, to care for our families, we take some of that and we offer it back to the Lord as part of worship to see the gospel continue to go forward through not only this local church, but our, our ministries that we support, both in Metro Detroit uh, and around the world. We support ministries in China. We have ministry in Romania that we support. And so we give uh, generously from our hearts with a joy because of the way Christ is taking care of us. That's what, that's what offering is. That's what, that's what uh, tithing or offering is here at Doxa. And if uh, that's you and you want to worship in that way this morning, we encourage you to go to uh, doxadetroit.org to the giving tab and, and to give this week. Uh, so that uh, this ministry can continue, so that other ministries that we support can continue, and that gospel can go forward. Give with joy. And if you are not part of Doxa Church, uh, we know there's a lot of folks that are finding us online. Uh, you, you're at home, you, you, it's Sunday morning, and you're going to watch something, and you, you happen upon our service, or maybe a friend told you about our services. We're so glad that you're part of it. We're so glad that you're checking this out. We're glad that you can uh, take in, sing along, uh, worship with us. 
Glad that you're here, but if you're not part of Doxa Church, we don't want anything from you. Don't, please don't give right now. Really, this is only a time for those who are part of this ministry uh, to give uh, to the ministry and to the Lord and in worship. So uh, let's uh, just take some time to pray uh, for, for, for the, all of the resources that God continues to bless our church with. Father, thank you so much for how you take care of us. You've taken care of this church through this pandemic. Uh, you are watching after your, your church, your, the body of Christ. Uh, you, are, you are guiding us even now. Oh, Lord, it feels like every week we have to rethink and reinvent how we're going to think about doing church community. And yet, you consistently have carried us through this. And we thank you for that, Father. Thank you, Lord, for the consistent giving of our folks, people who are going to the, the website and who are giving. Thank you, Father, for that, for continuing to bless. We pray for, we pray for people in our, in our community who are hurting financially, who, who, who for, for them, this is a very difficult time. And Lord, we know that many of us are, are, are blessed through this and many are not. Lord, give us uh, hearts of generosity and care. Lift up those who are hurting uh, through this time. We thank you, Lord, for all the ways that you continue to build up your church. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please stand and let's worship together again. Savior say thy strength indeed is small child of weakness watch and pray find in me thine all in all Jesus paid it all all to him I owe sin God left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Lord, now indeed I find thy power and thine alone can change the leper's spot. Jesus made all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. died my soul to save my lips shall still repeat Jesus made it all all to him I owe sin had left a crimson stain he washed it white as snow sing sin Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Oh, praise the one who paid my debt and raised his life up from the dead. Dead. Oh, praise the one who paid my debt and raised his life up from the dead. Oh, praise the one who paid my debt and raised his life up from the 
dead Cause Jesus made it all All to him I owe Sin had left a crimson stain He it white as snow. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Amen. Before the throne of God above, I have a strong and perfect plea. Great High Priest, whose name is Love, whoever lives in pleads for me. My name is graven on His hands. My name is written on His heart. I know that while in heaven he stands, no tongue can bid me thence depart. No tongue can bid me thence depart. When Satan tempts me to despair, Tells me of the guilt within Upward I look and see him there Who made an end to all my sin Because the sinless Savior died My sinful soul is counted free For God the just is satisfied on him and pardon me to look on him and pardon me behold him there the risen lamb my perfect spotless righteousness Great unchangeable I am, the King of glory and of grace. One with himself I cannot die, my soul is purchased by his blood. My life is hid with Christ on high, with Christ my Savior and my God. Christ my Savior and my God. Amen. Please be seated. Today's scripture reading comes from Genesis 37 and Matthew 26. Genesis 37, 12 through 36. Now his brothers went to pasture their father's flock near Shechem. And Israel said to Joseph, Are not your brothers pasturing the flock at Shechem? Come, I will send you to them. And he said to him, Here I am. So he said to him, Go, now see if it is well with your brothers and with the flock, and bring me word. So he sent them from the valley of Hebron, and he came to Shechem. And a man found him wandering in the fields. And the man asked him, What are you seeking? I am seeking my brothers, he said. Tell me, please, where they are pasturing the flock. And the man said, They have gone away, for I heard them say, Let us go to Dothan. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them at Dothan. They saw him from afar, and before he came near to them, they conspired against him to kill him. They said to one another, Here comes this dreamer. 
Come now, let us kill him and throw him into one of the pits. Then we will say that a fierce animal has devoured him, and we will see what will become of his dreams. But when Reuben heard it, he rescued him out of their hands, saying, Let us not take his life. And Reuben said to them, Shed no blood, throw him into this pit here in the wilderness, but do not lay a hand on him, that he might rescue him out of their hand to restore him to his father. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the robe of many colors that he wore. And they took him and threw him into a pit. The pit was empty. There was no water in it. Then they sat down to eat. And looking up, they saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead with their camels bearing gum, balm, and myrrh on their way to carry it down to Egypt. Then Judah said to his brothers, What profit is it if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites. And let not our hand be upon him, for he is our brother, our own flesh. And his brothers listened to him. Then Midianite traders passed by, and they drew Joseph up and lifted him out of the pit and sold him to the Ishmaelites for twenty shekels of silver. They took Joseph to Egypt. When Reuben returned to the pit and saw that Joseph was not in the pit, he tore his clothes and returned to his brothers and said, The boy is gone, and I, where shall I go? Then they took Joseph's robe and slaughtered a goat and dipped the robe in blood. And they sent the robe of many colors and brought it to their father and said, This we have found. Please identify whether it is your son's robe or not. And he identified it and said, It is my son's robe. A fierce animal has devoured him. Joseph is without doubt torn to pieces. Then Jacob tore his garments and put sackcloth on his loins and mourned for his son many days. All his sons and all his daughters rose up to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted and said, No, I shall go down to Sheol to my son, mourning. Thus his father wept for him. Meanwhile, the Midianites had sold him in Egypt to Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the guard. Matthew 26, 14 through 16, and 47 to 56. Then one of the twelve, whose name was Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and said, What will you give me if I deliver him over to you? And they paid him thirty pieces of silver. And from that moment, he sought an opportunity to betray him. While he was still speaking, Judas came, one of the twelve, and with him a great crowd with swords and clubs, from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had given them a sign, saying, The one I will kiss is the man. Seize him. And he came up to Jesus at once and said, Greetings, Rabbi. And he kissed him. Jesus said to him, Friend, do what you came to do. Then they came up and laid hands on Jesus and seized him. And behold, one of those who were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. Then Jesus said to him, Put your sword back into its place, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Do you think that I cannot appeal to my Father, and he will at once send me more than twelve legions of angels? But how then should the scriptures be fulfilled that it must be so? At that hour, Jesus said to the crowds, Have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs to capture me? Day after day I sat in the temple teaching, and you did not seize me. But all this has taken place that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples left him and fled. Well, this one is for the siblings. Any one of you who, including myself, who have ever had a sibling uh, growing up, you know full well that having siblings means having your share of rivalries and problems with those siblings. It, they just, it just goes hand in hand. I've got uh, one brother. Uh, we didn't fight too much growing up. We, we did not. Uh, we had actually a pretty great relationship, had a pretty great relationship as adults too. But there were times, there were times when we would get on each other's nerves. Uh, we, uh, we didn't ever get into fist fights when we were kids uh, or even wrestling matches or anything. We, we'd get on each other's nerves, but really nothing ever physical. The closest thing we ever got 
I think, I was trying to think about this, and I, I think the closest thing we ever got to was, uh, the f closest physical altercation, I'll say, uh, was the time when we were at youth group, we were at church, and uh, he was mad at me, probably because I said something dumb, and uh, he decided he wasn't going to uh, drive me home from youth group, and uh, <laughs> we were many miles from home, and so he started to pull his car away, and I ran in front of the car, and uh, he rolled up to me and stopped, and I put my hands on the, uh, on the hood of the car, and then he eased off the brake, and it was snowy out, and I, my feet slid back along with the car about maybe a foot, foot and a half, and then he stopped, and then that was it. Uh, could that have gone badly? Yes, it could have gone badly. It could have gone extremely badly. I could have tripped, and that would have been, what, manslaughter, I guess? Yeah, that, that could have been bad. But it was fine. Everything was fine. I just got into the car, and we, we rode home in silence. Anyway, all of that is in the very distant past, okay? Very distant past. There's no need for concern here. Although, I just want to point out that in that story, I'm the good one. Okay, that's it. That, that's, all, that's all I want to say about it. And now we can move on from there. We all get that if you have a sibling, if you have a sibling, you have fought with that sibling. There's no doubt about it. There's just no way that that has not happened. But nothing, and I mean nothing, rises to the level of the sibling rivalry and the relational breakdown that we are going to see in our passage today. The level of severity and callousness in this story is the lowest point we have reached among siblings since Cain killed Abel in chapter 4. And you might be expecting that the direction that we're going to go today then is how to have a better relationship with your sibling. You might feel like maybe that's where we're going to go with this today, and that would be helpful, right? I mean, who couldn't use that? The Lord wants our relationships to be good, so we could talk about that. But, you know, there's a lot of, maybe you're thinking that Genesis 37 is just sort of a cautionary tale uh, about how to, you know, anger toward each other can get out of hand. And it does get out of hand today. But surprisingly, this account of hatred and greed and uh, near murder has nothing to do with avoiding any of those behaviors. It has nothing to do with changing any of that. And it has everything to do with discovering the sovereign power and plans of God despite our every attempt to thwart him and to, and to go our own way and to, to submarine his plans for our own. God is actively carrying out his plans even in the most painful situations. And the truth, that truth can, can carry us through those situations. That's what we're going to look at today, the sovereignty of God. Please open your Bibles, if you would, to Genesis chapter 37. Now, you've already heard the story read aloud. Uh, on the surface, when you were listening to it, you might have felt like this, this story sounds like... Uh, the story of evil done between a group of men and their brother. And that's pretty much it in the story. But it's actually about a sovereign God aligning all things for his glory. So first, what I'm going to do is I want to summarize this story. I'm going to go back through it. I want to summarize the story for us so that we can lock it into our minds. And then I'm going to show you how two aspects of the Lord's sovereignty are at work here. Two aspects of it that I think that you'll find both are uh, uh, amazing and comforting at the same time. So let's begin by summarizing Joseph's very unlikely journey to Egypt. The scene opens with the 11 sons of Jacob taking care of the family flock in a, a land called Shechem while Jacob and his favorite son Joseph remain back at the house. Now, why isn't Joseph out there with his brothers? Probably because his dad likes him the most and wants to keep him close. And that's probably a good call given what happens to him when he goes to be with his brothers. He probably sensed there was some danger, some animosity, some troubles there. 
Jacob apparently uses Joshua, sort of like a, a, a mid-level manager who drops in to see how things are going and then reports back to corporate. That's, that's, he sends him out, see what things are happening, come back. And of course, Joseph has done this before. We were told uh, in the first, uh, first part of chapter 37 that he went out and he came back with a bad report. So they didn't really like the reports that, that Joseph brought back. But that's how he's being used in the family business. It's interesting to me that Jacob stays home and his favorite son Joshua stays home with him, given that's exactly how it was, it was for Jacob when he was growing up with his mom. He was his mom's favorite, and he always stayed back at the tents while Esau went out into the fields. Now, there's probably not anything to make of that, but it is an interesting generational detail that I noticed while I was reading through this. It's interesting how generations tend to repeat themselves. Joshua sends Jacob out to see how things are going with his brothers, and he's supposed to then bring that word back to Jacob. So, Jacob, so, so Joseph uh, sets out, and when he arrives in Shechem, the brothers aren't there. They're, they're just not there. But there's a man who finds uh, Joseph wandering in the fields and points him in the direction of Dothan because he's overheard that's where the brothers went. Now, you might be thinking, why include that mundane detail? Why include that detail that, 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 that Joseph uh, spends some time in Shechem before he moves on to Dothan? I was thinking that too as I was reading. I was like, this really doesn't seem to add to the story very much. But keep it in mind. We're going to actually come back to this in a second. So, so Joseph goes to Dothan and he finds his brothers there. And then in verse 18... The perspective switches. We have a, a change in sort of the camera moves away from Joseph and down to his brothers. And now we're with the brothers. And they see Joseph coming from a distance in that distinctive coat of possibly many or just one color. And they decide that this is their chance. This is, this is what they've been waiting for. They're far from home. No one will ever know what they do to Joseph out here. Here comes the dreamer, they say. So as much as they hated him before for being the family favorite, he's now known as the dreamer. This is their new way of referring to their little brother because these dreams have become a shorthand way of characterizing the worst aspect of him. These dreams are the epitome of their hatred. Preferential treatment, special clothing, all of that pales in comparison to the idea that Joseph would rule over his brothers with authority. And so they devise a plan where they'll, they're going to kill him and they're going to throw him into a pit and they're going to tell Jacob that a wild animal devoured him. Look down at verse 20. Notice what it says. We will see what will come of his dreams. See, that's their motivation. This will prevent the dream from ever coming true. Killing Joseph will ensure that he will never reign over them. In other words, if they take drastic action against Joseph, they can then take their own futures into their hands. They can then dictate at that point the freedom and autonomy of their futures. They, they don't want Joseph to ever have any authority over the top of them, and this will end it. This will kill those dreams. Well, Reuben, the oldest, hears the plan, and he decides that it's not a good idea. Now, he proposes that instead of killing him, they simply put him into a pit. Reuben's plan is then to go get him out of the pit and to bring him home back to his father Jacob at a later time. Now, we're not really given a reason why Reuben wants to save Joshua. Uh, Joshua. Joseph. Oh, my goodness. All my J names. I'm terrible at this. But clearly Reuben thinks that murdering him is wrong. So clearly thinks that Reuben thinks that murdering Joseph is the wrong thing to do. And so he says, let us not take his life. Shed no blood. Do not lay a hand on him. And it says he, he wants to rescue him and he wants to restore him. So I think Reuben thought murder was, was too much. 
and he uses position as the oldest brother to, to end this murder plot. He's got some kind of pull, some, some veto power here, and he uses that to, to squelch this plan. So that's what they do. Instead of, instead of killing him, when Joseph arrives, they strip him of his special coat, and they throw him into a pit. And then what happens next is pretty dark. They go have lunch. Wow. So they, they get done, they strip him, they throw him in a pit. They're, you guys hungry? Man, that is cold. It's like a scene out of a mob movie. They look up from, they're, so they're, they're sitting there, they're eating their lunch, and they look up from, from eating their lunch, and this Ishmaelite trader group is moving through with their goods and they're heading down to Egypt and, and Judah uh, gets the idea that that they should sell Joseph as a slave to this trader group so, so that instead of just concealing a murder they can they can actually get some cash from him and and and, and this was his reasoning look at verse 27 look at his reasoning let not our hand be upon him for he is our brother our own flesh. Right. I'm sure that's the concern. Mm -hmm. He wasn't taking advantage of him to get some money out of him. So they sell Joseph to the traders. And they sell him to for, the, for 20 shekels, it says, 20 shekels of silver. Reuben was apparently not there when they did this. So he was gone for some reason. And he shows back up. And he looks in the pit, and he sees that Joseph isn't there anymore, and he has this sort of existential pity party at this point. The boy is gone, and I, where shall I go? Basically, my life from here forward is over. What will my existence be? Interesting that his immediate concern is for himself here. It's also interesting that he recognizes that the responsibility here is ultimately going to fall to him as the oldest and presumably the one who is in charge of everything that happens. Uh, I think this gets at why Reuben wanted to save Joseph in the first place. I think he realized that this would all fall back on him. That's, that was his motivation all along. So they take Joseph's coat. And as promised last week, this is the part where the coat comes into play as a minor part of a much bigger story. Because it needs to be a distinctive coat for, for identification purposes. They tear the coat up, they dip it in goat's blood, and they present it to Joseph's father, Jacob. They don't lie to him about what happened. They don't tell him a story. They simply present the coat to him. And they ask him if it's Joseph's coat. And Joseph then fills in the blanks in his own mind. My son is without a doubt torn to pieces. Do you remember how Jacob went about fooling Isaac into giving him the family blessing? He dressed his brother in his brother's clothes and he put goat skin and blood on himself so that he would look and feel like Esau. And now, here, Jacob is fooled by his sons with clothes and blood to believe something about his son that isn't true. Like that former deception, this deception changes the course of the future. Jacob doesn't bother to look for Joseph at this point. He sees the coat. He knows there's no reason to look for him. He's surely, without a doubt, torn to pieces. And he just goes into mourning. Nobody can snap him out of it. It's horrible. And meanwhile, Joseph is sold by the traders into slavery to Potiphar, who is an officer in the Pharaoh's military. And that's where our passage ends. And it may feel like nothing has happened. It may feel like uh, that was just a story about a tragic, horrible family that, uh, that, that didn't make good choices, that, who's got let their hatred get out of control, and it would be a shame if all you walked away with this morning is, we shouldn't act this way. It's, it's, it is horrible, and we shouldn't, but there's more going on here than meets the eye. Let me show you two ways that the sovereignty of God 
is at work here because it's absolutely remarkable. The first way is that God is sovereign over every detail of the plan. Ian Duguid is a professor at Westminster Theological Seminary, one of my one of my schools, one of one of the places I went to school. And I have been reading a lot of his material on Genesis as we've been working through the book of Genesis. And he drew my attention uh, this week to something very interesting here, something very important. Notice the precision of the events necessary to get Joseph to Egypt. I mean, this is like a fine tuned watch. This whole passage is like, a, is like a, a very, very high quality watch with very, very small parts that all work together. And if you remove any of these parts, the watch stops working and Joseph's journey to, to, to Egypt is derailed. First, he's at home and has to go to his brother's. If he was already with his brothers, they wouldn't have had opportunity to do this plotting and planning, to see him from a distance and to come up with their plan in the first place. Then Joseph goes to Shechem and he can't find his brothers. But there's a guy there who happens to find him and happens to have overheard where these particular men were going, that they were going to Dothan. Now, why can't all of these events take place in Shechem, you say? Why, why would that be, why is that a necessary step? Maybe you say it isn't a necessary step, but it is a necessary step because Shechem isn't on the main travel route to Egypt, but Dothan is. So the brothers go to Dothan and an unnamed man is there to send Joseph on his way. Then the brothers are going to kill him. But Reuben is, is there, and he steps in, and he saves him. It could have ended there. It could have ended with Reuben saving Joseph. But what was Reuben's plan? He was going to return Joseph to Jacob. So Reuben's plan was necessary to save Joseph's life, but the plan that Reuben had had to fail to give Judah enough time to see the Ishmaelite traders that were coming. Then Reuben had to be mysteriously absent, and that gave the brothers enough time to sell Joseph into slavery to the traders in Dothan, a place that they never intended to be. Now, that is quite a story, isn't it? And the, the cry at this point, the 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 the, the the argument that would come back against sovereignty here might come from an atheist or it might just come from somebody who doubts God's sovereignty, his, his, his control, his power to, to, uh, to move his plan forward, to, to reign over everything. Somebody who doesn't believe in God's sovereignty at this point might come back and say, well, this is not a divine plan at work at all. All of this can be explained as simply an unlikely set of random circumstances. And they might argue that lots of unlikely things happen all the time. They would say that the only reason that this is odd to us is because it's not what you'd expect. It's not, it's not what it would normally happen. And if that's you this morning, I can understand your view. I can. That makes sense to me. I get where you're coming from there. I know why you would say something like that. But consider the biblical view, worldview. Consider the way the Bible depicts what's going on here. In the passage we looked at last week, Joseph had two dreams. In each dream, he was exalted over his family as they bowed down to him. As, as you can imagine, they didn't take that very well and enjoy that very much. But as we said last week, these are just dreams. You know, just because you dream something doesn't mean it, it, it's true. And I asked the question last week of whether or not they should just be dismissed, as most dreams should just be dismissed, or if the Lord was communicating something in these dreams. Was the Lord doing something to communicate the future through these dreams? Now, the fact that they're in the Bible should be a little bit of a clue of what's happening. Yes, these are going to be important, right? But consider this. At any point in this story, if one detail had been out of alignment, not only would Joseph not be in Egypt, he would probably be dead at any point. 
Call it a coincidence if you want to, but the very men who sought to kill Joseph and squash his dreams enabled the circumstances that will bring about the fulfillment of those dreams. Which begs the question, is God doing this all the time? Is this, is this normal? Is the Lord at every turn bringing about his will through the alignment of the most minute details of life? The biblically consistent answer to that question is yes. The, the Lord's sovereignty superintends every thought and action of all creation to serve the purpose of bringing about the redemption of all creation in Christ. Strictly speaking, there is no such thing as a coincidence. There, there is no such thing. You've never experienced a moment outside of the divine guidance of God. That's never happened. Don't gloss over Christ's words in the, in the Sermon on the Mount when he said that, that God clothes the flowers and feeds the birds as part of his sovereign care. Or, or, or more clearly, he says it in Matthew chapter 10, are not two sparrows sold for a penny? And not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. But even the hairs of your head are all numbered. As I was writing this sermon, right before I got to this point, I stepped on an ant that was trying to crawl up my leg. And then I read this passage and I felt really bad. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> God knew that was going to happen. There's not an inexpensive sparrow on earth that has died apart from God's will. Your shower drain is filled with the hair God caused to fall out of your head by his sovereign will. And to what end? What is the purpose of, of all of this? Why is God working out all of the details of his creation in accordance with his plan? Romans 8, 28 and 29 says it clearest. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. In order that he might be firstborn among many brothers. God is working out all things for the good of those who love Jesus so that we will be conformed to the image of Jesus. Now, can we always point to everything that happens and know for sure what the Lord is doing and how it plays into his divine plan? Absolutely not. Of course not. We have plenty of other passages in Scripture that tell us that we can't always know exactly what the Lord is doing. But one of the great joys of trusting in Jesus is knowing that no matter what we encounter, it is all intended to mold us into the likeness of Christ for the glory of God. And that means everything. Everything. Not just the stuff we like. Can you imagine sitting in that pit with Joseph? Later in the book, we'll find out that he pleaded with his brothers not to do this to him. Pleaded with him, stop, don't do this to me. Can you imagine how he would have, he would have interpreted his circumstances at that point? Should have cut my losses in Shechem. Why did I go on to Dothan? Why did I listen to that random dude in the field? Seriously, why did I wear this coat? I could have worn a less elaborate coat. <sighs> See, from the pit to being sold into slavery, none of this would have been interpreted in that moment for Joseph's good. He wouldn't have said, this is good. He would have thought, this is terrible. And yet God is not just intervening in the moments of victory or the moments of joy or the big moments of life. He's superintending even the dark times, even the mundane times. My son Samuel plays uh, Madden on Xbox. If you're not familiar, that is a video game football. And uh, let's be honest, we both play it, but he plays it well and I'm getting increasingly terrible at it. And uh, on Tuesday night I was, I was eating dinner and Samuel was playing Madden. I thought, well, I'll sit down and watch him play while I eat. And, uh, when I sat down 
to watch him play, I realized that he wasn't playing the game. The game was playing itself, and he was also just watching the game. And so I, I asked him why he wasn't playing the game, and he said that he was playing a mode of the game called playing the moments. He said instead of playing the whole game, the game plays itself until there's a big moment where then he then takes over to score the touchdown or to have the big defensive stop. I almost had a back in my day moment at that point. <laughs> I was, I, I just, a, a video game version of back in my day. I mean, is this where we are now? Is this where we've come? Am I so old? Back in my day, you had to play the whole video game. We only had four plays. It was called Tecmo Bowl, and we loved it. But the more I thought about, the more I thought about this new mode of the game, playing the moments, the more it struck me that this is often the way we think of God's involvement in our lives. We turn to the Lord in the big moments for the big choices. When we're afraid, we pray, we believe that he'll intervene. When, when we are in need, when we're helpless and we need him to provide, we think it's time to go to the Lord and he'll provide for us. And that's fine to do. We are called to do that and we should do that. But church, we are not on our own otherwise. God is not just playing the moments. He, he's going to be with Joseph on the throne eventually. If you've read the book of Genesis, you know that's where we're headed. He's going to be there eventually. But right now, he's with him in the pit and on the journey to Egypt. In fact, he put him in the pit. He put him in slavery in Egypt. The Lord is playing every second and every snap of the game. He's there superintending every pain and every failure you have ever had. Church, if you love Jesus, the Lord is employing everything that happens to you to mold your heart and to mold your mind and your soul into the image of Christ. He's using every moment of your life to prepare you for an eternal weight of glory with him in Christ that is beyond all comparison. And this truth leads us inevitably to the second aspect of God's sovereignty on display in this passage. And that's that God is sovereign over our sin. There's one unavoidable, difficult question here. Did God ordain the sin of Joseph's brothers to send him to Egypt? Did God use the hatred of the brothers as a tool in his hands to bring about the future he already foretold in Joseph's dreams. In judo, in the martial art judo, you use the weight of your opponent's attack as a tool to take your opponent down. So, so the harder I come at you, the more leverage you would then have to flip me over and take me to the ground, throw me to the ground. What kind of theological judo is at work in the move God has just performed in this passage? Did he seriously give Joseph dreams that stirred the brothers' anger to the point that they would sell him into slavery so that God could fulfill those dreams? It's exactly what happened. It's exactly what happened. I can't fully explain it, but in the mysterious sovereign plan of the Lord, he is using human sin to undo the power of sin and death. This is remarkably comforting in, in a couple of different ways. So comforting. The first way, church, is that it means that there is no sin you have ever committed that God has not used for the furtherance of his plan to bring the world under the glorious reign of Christ. That is not to say that sin itself glorifies God. We know that sin itself does not. It's an attack against the Lord. It's rebellion against him. It's a, it's a fight coming to him. It's an attack against him. But just as a judo fighter doesn't enjoy the assault, he can use the assault for his purposes. 
In the Lord's mysterious sovereignty, he has shown you your need for Christ through your own failure to honor him. That's one way he's used your sin. He's used it as the backdrop of his grace. The grace of Jesus shines most brightly against the backdrop of our sinful rebellion against the Lord. I think there, are, there is a great comfort for us in this. Not that it would serve as a license or an encouragement to sin, but to give us the assurance that the Lord has, can, and will always use our failure for his glory. It's one of the ways that he redeems us through the renewing of our minds. His sovereignty over our sin gives us the ability to truly give over our past to him. We can truly say, God, I know all of the ways that I have failed you. And I give them to you because in your sovereignty, you have, you have worked that for my good. You have shown me my failure so that I can see Christ more clearly. It will help us with our past sin. It will help us with our present struggles to be faithful to the Lord. But the second way that God's sovereignty over our sin is oddly comforting is that Jesus' death also came about because of the sins of his brothers. Joseph was sold for 20 pieces of silver. He was sent to his doom for money. Judas betrayed Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. He sold out Jesus' hidden location in the Garden of Gethsemane for money. Now the details there are different, but the pattern is the same. The Lord used human sin in the ultimate judo move to undo the power of sin and death, to set us free. But here's the difference. Here's the difference between Joseph and Jesus here. Jesus knew exactly what was happening. Jesus was aware. Joseph may have been at a loss for what was going on for him. He may have only had a vague uh, understanding based on his dreams of what might come about. But Jesus knew that the outcome of Judas' betrayal And he knew it better than Judas himself. The Lord Jesus allowed the attack of sin to come crashing into him willingly because he knew its weight precisely. Listen to Jesus address the crowd that Judas led to the garden to take him away. Do you think that I cannot appeal to my father and he will at once send me more than 12 legions of angels? But how then should the scriptures be fulfilled, that it must be so? At that hour, Jesus said to the crowds, Have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs to capture me? Day after day I sat in the temple teaching, and you did not seize me. But all this has taken place, that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled." On the cross, Jesus used the weight of sin to put sin on its head. Church, let this give you every confidence that the Lord is in full control. There is nothing that will thwart the plans to bring all of creation under the authority of Christ. There was nothing done to Christ that did not play perfectly into his plan of salvation. There is nothing that you can do or that can be done against you that also will not ultimately lead to the gathering of all God's people and the renewal of all things in Christ. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you for your incredible sovereignty over every detail of this life. Lord, we don't fully understand it, but it gives us great comfort to know that you are in control. That even, when we, even in our darkest moments, even in our most mundane moments, when we're, when we're bored, when we're scared, when we're frightened, when, when we don't know what's next, Lord, you are there superintending all things according to your will, controlling, planning, bringing us to a fuller understanding of Christ so that we can be conformed to the image of Christ. Thank you, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please stand and let's worship together one last time. the power of sin and darkness, who 
His love is mighty and so much stronger. The King of glory, the King above all kings. Who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder, who leaves us breathless in awe and wonder. King of glory, King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You laid down your life. That I would be set free. I sing for all that you've done for me. Who brings our chaos back into order? Who makes the orphan a son and daughter? The King of glory, the King of glory, who rules the nations and justice shines like the sun in all of its brilliance the king of glory the king above all kings this is amazing grace this is unfailing love that you would take my place that you would bear my cross down your life and I would be set free oh Jesus I sing for all that you've done for me worthy is the lamb who was slain worthy is the king who conquered the grave Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy, worthy, worthy. Oh, this is amazing grace. This is unfailing love That you would take my place That you would bear my cross You laid down your life That I would be set free Oh, Jesus, I sing for All that you've done for me Amen. Walk in faithfulness, knowing that Christ is with you and is in control this week. Have a wonderful week.